a greater violation of the laws of investigation has never been perpetrated. The whole subject as developed and applied by the theoretical philosophers is to the fullest degree unreasonable and absurd, not a jot or tittle better than the reasoning contained in the following letter. Previous quotes, Manchester and Examiner Supplement, May 24th, 1851 better than the reasoning contained in the following letter. Sir, allow me to call your serious and polite attention to the extraordinary phenomenon demonstrating the rotation of the earth, which I at this present moment experience, and you yourself or anybody else I have not the slightest doubt would be satisfied of under similar circumstances. Some skeptical and obstinate individuals may doubt that the earth's motion is visible but I say from personal observation is it, a, it is a positive fact. I don't care about latitude or longitude or vibratory pendulum revolving around the sign of a tangent on a spherical surface, nor axes, nor apsides, nor anything of the sort. That is all rubbish. All I know is I see the ceiling of this coffee room going round. I perceive this distinctly with the naked eye, only my sight has been sharpened by a slight stimulant. I write after my sixth go of brandy and water, whereof witness my hand, Swiggins, Goose and Gridhorn, May 5th, 1851. P.S. Why do two waiters come when I only call one? End quote. The whole matter is handled by the astronomical theorists is fully deserving of the ridicule implied in the above quotation from Punch. But because great ingenuity has been shewn and much thought and devotion manifested in connection with it, and the general public thereby greatly deceived, it is necessary that the subject should be fairly and seriously examined. What are the facts? The above quote was from Punch, May 10th, 1851. What are the facts? First, when a pendulum constructed according to the plan of M. Foucault is allowed to vibrate, its plane of vibration is often variable, but not always. The variation, when it does occur, is not uniform is not always the same in the same place, nor always the same either in its rate or velocity or in its direction. It cannot therefore be taken as evidence, for that which is inc inconstant cannot be used in favor or against any given pro proposition. It therefore is not evidence and proves nothing. Secondly, if the plane of vibration is observed to change, where is the connection between such change and the supposed motion of the earth? What principle of reasoning guides the experimenter to the conclusion that it is the earth which moves underneath the pendulum and not the pendulum which moves over the earth? What logical right or necessity forces one conclusion in preference of the other? Thirdly, why was not the peculiar arrangement of the point of suspension of the pendulum specially considered in regard to its possible influence upon the plane of oscillation? Was it not known, or was it overlooked, or was it, in the climax of theoretical revelry, ignored that a, quote, ball and socket joint is one which facilitates circular motion more readily than any other, and that a pendulum so suspended as was M. Foucault's could not, after passing over one arc of vibration, return to the same arc without there being many chances to one that its globular point of suspension would slightly turn or twist its bed, and therefore give the return or backward oscillation in a slight change of direction? Let the immediate cause of pendulum's liability to change its plane of vibration be traced, and it will be found not to have the slightest connection with the motion or non-motion of the surface over which it vibrates. At a recent meeting of the French Academy of Sciences, M. de Haute sent in a note stating that M. Foucault, whose experiments on the pendulum affected a few years ago at the Pantheon are of European notoriety, quote, is not the first discoverer of the fact that a plane of oscillation of the free pendulum is invariable, but that the honor of the discovery is due to Poinsonnet de Sivry, who in 1780 stated in a note to his translation of Pliny, that a mariner's compass might be constructed without a magnet by making a pendulum and setting it in motion in a given direction, because, provided the motion were continually kept up, the pendulum would continue to oscillate in the same direction, no matter how many points or how often the ship might happen to change her course. End of section 12.